All right. So you'll probably actually, yeah, you'll remember this from our Southern Italy uh, venture, but today we're going to be talking about Northern Italy. Uh, the parts we're going to be talking about, let me go ahead and uh, kind of zoom in here a little bit. So here's our Northern Italy. Uh, the first part uh, region is going to be our Pinot Grigio is going to be coming from this Trento Tino Alto Aldige, uh, which is this little area right here. <laughs> now it's, as you can see, um, on the Alpine border between Austria and Switzerland, a region of two distinct cultures. And actually, uh, between these, the how you see the the Balzano and the Trento, uh, they are actually kind of like almost nearly autonomous regions. So the northern section is is actually far more Germanic, uh, while the south is you know definitely a lot more uh, Italian. So the the Pinot in particular is from the Val de uh, which you can see on, uh, uh oh, I think my headphones just told me that uh, I am running out of battery. So hold on, let me uh, switch over to my plugged in one so that uh, all of a sudden I don't all of a sudden go uh, silent on you. All right. Uh, does everyone still hear me? Okay. So uh, again, this Pinot uh, from the Val d'Adige area uh, down near this Trent area, uh, that subset is named after the Aldige River that kind of runs through that area. Uh, the second place we're going to be looking at is down here in Tuscany. Now, again, we kind of already talked about Tuscany in our Southern Italian experience, uh, but while the largest portion is this whole Chianti region here, um, there is a small little area directly south of Siena, which is kind of this little area here, um, called Brunello, or sorry, uh, Montalcino. And they grow a very specific kind of Sangiovese, because remember, all, all Chianti uh, is, for the most part, 80% Sangiovese. Um, but they grow a, a very, but there's different types of Sangiovese. And the one that uh, this place in Montalcino grows is called Sangiovese Grosso that has a, almost like a superior flavor. It's, you know, and that's the reason why it's also cultivated, um, you know, much more. And it's also the reason why it's kind of priced a little bit more. Um, the question is, why does the rest of Tuscany not grow, you know, specifically that if it's the, you know, kind of better grape? And the reason why is it's a tough one to grow um, outside of very optimal soil and weather conditions. Back out, our next place that we're going to is up here in Ven Veneto, which um, you'll remember from the Southern, we kind of hit here with the Prosecco last time. And that's that part there with, with the Prosecco, uh, with the Glera grape is here over near Venice. Now this time around though, um, we're gonna be, this is, this is where the Amarone comes from and it is more over in this area. So um, it's kind of like up against the Alps, which is, you know, this whole kind of region here. And, you know, what they grow there is a grape called Corvina, which is what makes Amarone. Now I'll, I'll get to, you know, the actual you know, wine Amarone um, here in just a little bit. This is, again, we're, we're just kind of touching on the regions right now. Um, and then the last area that we're going to be looking at is this big area right here. 
which is Piedmont. Now, Piedmont, um, kind of grow, you know, it's it's bordering comparatively to you know the, these areas up here, which are kind of bordering on you know Switzerland, Austria. Uh, Piedmont, on the other hand, is bordering France and Switzerland, so they actually have a lot more of uh, that kind of, you know, one, they also have a, a French influence. Uh, but yeah, they also have, you know, uh, their, one of their wines is kind of in common with uh, Frau Blank, Blanklish, uh, uh, mother's milk. <laughs> uh, now Piedmont, um, it, it's kind of funny that being Italian, it's actually a French word for foot of the mountain. And uh, again, you have the, the Alps to, to your north and kind of to your west here, but you also have the, the Apennines that are kind of like, you know, down here to the south and the east. So it, it's, it's this, they're, they're really surrounded by, you know, like mountain ranges. And this is where kind of like the, what they call the, the best grapes kind of grow, which are, are in there. Um, but uh, in there, they have, there's two, two big wines that, that grow in this, this Piedmont region. Um, the first one, um, for, for the, those of you with like a super sweet tooth, um, might know Moscato. So Moscato di Osti, meaning from Osti. Uh, that's where that is, you know, kind of like grown, which is like a really sweet, fizzy, you know, slightly fizzy drink. Um, now Nebbiolo, on the other hand, uh, they actually they actually have two subregions, um, or should I say, well, the other grape Nebbiolo that that's grown here has two main subregions, because you never I mean you, you you'll actually see like Nebbiolo uh, you know a, a bottle that just says Nebbiolo on it, but um, the same grape is in two places called Barolo and Barbaresco. Now those are two regions that are, you know, within Piedmont. I should just learn to do something else other than red. Um, but right here is Barolo. Now, as you can see, it's like right up against the mountain. Um, and the other place is Barbaresco, which is kind of here. Now, both of those um, are, are like your high end Nebbiolo. And, and, you know, so that's why those are really sought after um, and why, you know, e even the ones that, that we got, you know, that are kind of on that 40 to $50 range are actually on kind of the lower end. You know, if you saw there was like, you know, they're most of the typical uh, ones that you're going to, you know, find out there are like 70 to, to $90. So uh, let's go ahead and dive into some of these wines. Now, I'm gonna wet my whistle a little bit. So, first one on the list. Um, there's not really that much I can say about the Pinot Grigio, um, beyond that it's kind of a, the same grape as like French Pinot Gris. Uh, Pete, the Grigio having a lot more kind of uh, acid and, and tartness to it than uh, the French Gris, because they're thought to be a little bit more round and sweeter. Um, the, let's see. So again, the, the Brunello, which was again here, has some very stringent rules on its production. So like all, all the one, like pretty much like all the ones that we're going to be tasting today do, uh, except for maybe the Pinot Grigio. Um, the Brunello, has to be 100% Sangiovese Grosso. So comparatively to the Chiantis, um, you know, and and like the Super Tuscans and whatnot, where it's like you have to have like 80% Sangio or you know somewhere in that range. No, like this has to be 100% Sangiovese Grosso. It also has to be aged in wood for about two years, and at least four months in the bottle. Um, and even past that, it can't be sold. And, and it's, it's the way with 
I'll, I'll get into a, a, a bit of a story a little bit later, but um, a lot of Italian wines are really unapproachable as, when they're young um, because they're, they're just really astringent. And one of the rules for Bruno de, de Montalcino is that it can't be sold before January 1st of the fifth year following its harvest. So, you know, you, you've seen a 2014, 2015, that's the latest ones released. 